the London train at Darlington to avoid reporters. Fellow passengers gave a mixed reaction to his resignation. Well, I just think it uh, should have been done a lot earlier, the first fall that he had. We should have done it then, really. Well, I think that anybody who's Minister of State for Transport has got an extremely tough job since privatisation. And Byers was probably one of the best people who could possibly do the job. I feel, I thought it might have happened a long time ago. And I think it needs to happen because I think um, he's discredited really in terms of um, his own party. Eventually, Mr Byers did arrive at his home in Newcastle. He kept his comments short, but the emotion was obvious. I've really got nothing to add to the statement I made in London this afternoon. This has been a nightmare of a day for me, and I'm just really pleased to be back home here on Tyneside. For the first time in this long saga, Mr Byers seemed close to breaking point. To his supporters, it was the end of an epic struggle. He'd been strongly backed by the Prime Minister, who saw him as the ultimate loyal Blairite, and by most Labour MPs. But it was the lack of public support, shown in the opinion polls, which he finally realised could not be overcome. John Sargent, ITV News, Westminster. There was some sympathy for Mr Byers this evening from the main players in the episode, which perhaps more than any other undermined his ministerial career, the row about spin in his department. Martin Sigsmith, his former PR chief, said it was a shame it had ended like this. Joe Moore, former spin doctor, told ITV News it was very sad. Here's Joe Andrews. As he went tonight, Stephen Byers said the comment would be about spin doctors. And in many senses, this minister, like so many members of New Labour, has lived and died by spin. It was the disastrous intervention by his long-serving spin doctor, Joe Moore, that began his slide out of office, when on September the 11th, she suggested burying bad news. She apologised, but many think if she'd gone then, her boss might have been spared his exit. Tonight, she said she was sorry at the news. I think it's very sad. She did eventually go, engulfed in a fresh row between Mr Byers and his press chief, Martin Sixsmith, that at times seemed to involve most senior figures in the department. Had Mr Byers had a hand in Mr Sixsmith's resignation, he said not. No, these are, these are personnel matters. No conversation and I do with not him. Get, I do not get involved in personnel matters. They are not a matter for a Secretary of State. So but he was then forced to the Commons to explain himself on two separate occasions as it became clear that Mr Sixsmith hadn't resigned at all. Tonight, he said it needn't have ended like this. I'm still Stephen Byers' Director of Communications until next Friday, and that's when my contract uh, expires. So obviously I can't make any comment about this, except perhaps to say that it's a pity it all ended like this, and that if uh, things had been done differently, then uh, perhaps the outcome could have been very different as well. This month, Mr Byers landed in further trouble over a Euro briefing. Speaking to a lunch of women political journalists, he told them he expected a bill this autumn to pave the way for a referendum on the Euro. Downing Street denied it outright and said he was simply wrong. They keep saying they're looking at their spin machine and Alistair Campbell recently said that um, they had to, you know, the spin had been overdone and it had to be reduced, but they're a bit like, it's a bit like a shoplifter saying, I'm going to stop. You know, it's a compulsion for them now. It's part of their essence. They can't stop. This is Mr. Byer's department, the scene of so many of his troubles. He now leaves it behind and with it the problem for Mr. Blair of finding a competent minister to occupy this office and to do something about Britain's crumbling transport system. Joe Andrews, ITV News, Westminster. While Mr Byers undoubtedly had problems with spin, in many ways they paled into insignificance when compared to Britain's transport problems. They continued to mount under his stewardship, though as John Draper explains, many thought he was beginning to get to grips with them. This was one of Mr Byers' last public duties as Transport Secretary, attending the scene of the Potter's Bar crash. The state of the nation's railways and other transport systems was always a more pressing issue for the public than Westminster spin. But while there were many commuters glad to see him go, others, like Richard Branson, with rail and airline interests, had a more rounded assessment. His legacy would be that he, he has managed to get a tremendous team of people uh, in running the Strategic Rail Authority, uh, running Rail Track, uh, running the Civil Aviation Authority. 
And while train safety is a continuing concern, a lawyer for victims of the Paddington crash believed too much criticism had been heaped on Stephen Byers. Some of his mistakes were over presentation and spin and all the rest of it. Um, and, uh, but I think that some of the things, like taking rail track into administration, were good things. And I think that the overall problem is government policy, not the identity of the Secretary of State himself. In fact, it was John Prescott who launched the 10-year transport plan, which Mr Byers inherited, and which was slated only last week by a Labour-dominated committee of MPs. The problems they identified in shifting people from roads to the railways still have to be resolved, whoever's in charge. Many in the railway industry thought Stephen Byers wasn't doing a bad job at transport, but in a government department that's notoriously difficult to run, he had repeated political distractions. In the end, the public probably don't care who the Secretary of State is, rather that the government gets on with the job, and that's exactly what they'll expect his successor to do. John Draper, ITV News at London's King's Cross Station. Let's go back now to our political editor, John Sargent. John, people have been calling for Mr. Byers' head almost daily over the last few months. Why did he decide to go now? Well, if you may remember, Trevor, I said some time ago, a couple of weeks ago, that he wouldn't go unless the controversy died down. And I think that's why he chose today to announce the decision. Parliament is not sitting. Most MPs, if not all MPs, are not here. They're away on holiday or they're doing things in their constituency. So he had perfect conditions, really, so that he wouldn't have to face the House of Commons. The Prime Minister does not have to answer Prime Minister's questions for another fortnight. So this, I think, was the first moment when he could do it on his terms, which is what he wants to do. I think the harder question is why he didn't go earlier because obviously what has happened now is almost the worst possible position for the government. They struggle to keep him, he struggles on, he gets involved in more and more scrapes in the House of Commons, he's endlessly accused of lying, and he finally goes. So it doesn't look at all good for him, it doesn't look at all good for the government. So although he chose a nice quiet day, the damage to the government is considerable. And how damaging has this been for Tony Blair personally? Well, quite a lot. I mean, at one stage, if you remember, the Prime Minister had to defend Mr. Byers when he made this extraordinary comments to the House of Commons about how he had not misled the House of Commons, even though everyone could see that what he was saying was diametrically opposite to what he had said three months ago about Martin Sixsmith's resignation. The Prime Minister had to defend that himself, and that stretched the whole English language further than it's ever been stretched in my memory uh, at Westminster. And lots of people just thought, well, this is extremely embarrassing for the Prime Minister. Why doesn't he get rid of him? I think one of the reasons why he didn't was because of memories of John Major being forced to lose ministers when the press ganged up against them. Mr Blair was determined to show that he's in charge, but ultimately that whole strategy has failed. And John, briefly, his successor? Well, Charles Clark, Labour Party chairman, very likely to be the next transport secretary. Another person in the frame, John Reid, the Northern Ireland secretary. Both of them would certainly do the job better than Mr Byers. John Sargent, thank you. Other news now. The Foreign Secretary Jack Straw has begun his mission to try to prevent war between India and Pakistan over Kashmir. He's already met Pakistan's President, General Musharraf. Tomorrow he'll see the Indian Prime Minister. Our Asia correspondent Julian Mannion is travelling with Mr Straw. The Foreign Secretary landed in the middle of the night at the start of a gruelling 36-hour mission to try to persuade the two nuclear-armed neighbours to step back from the brink. Soon after his arrival, more evidence of how tense the situation has become. The third Pakistani missile test in four days. This was a short-range missile able to carry a nuclear payload. And this morning, a leading Pakistani newspaper reported that both sides have now moved tactical nuclear warheads close to the border. After just a few hours sleep, the Foreign Secretary began his talks on the central issue of Pakistani support for the Muslim militants in Kashmir. In public, the Pakistani leader has tried to be both conciliatory and firm, declaring that his country does not want war with India, but will respond with full force if attacked. After his talks, I asked Jack Straw if he was now more confident that some sort of progress could be achieved. You can never be confident in this kind of situation. It's a, a very acute situation. Uh, however, I am in no doubt that it's important that we should do our very best to try uh, to avert uh, the possibility of conflict and war, even though I'm also in no doubt that 
uh, we may not succeed. The Foreign Secretary says it will take time to assess the results of his talks with President Musharraf. But at the halfway point of his peacemaking trip, with his meeting with the Indian Prime Minister yet to come, it's clear that so far there has been no breakthrough. Julian Mannion, ITV News, Islamabad. As we mentioned earlier, Russia and NATO agreed today to work together on terrorism and arms control. The historic deal was signed in Rome by Russia and 19 NATO countries. President Putin said it was hard to overestimate the significance of the ceremony after enmity dating back to the days of the Cold War. The mobile phone operator Vodafone announced the UK's biggest ever corporate losses today, 13 billion pounds. That's 37 million a day. But as our business editor Caroline Kerr reports, even so, it isn't as bad as the experts had been led to believe. Vodafone was once the darling of the city. Now it's recording record losses of £37 million a day. The problem is most of us already have mobiles, but the company has continued expanding even though the telecoms market has stopped growing. Nonetheless, Vodafone's chief executive told me he's unapologetic about a £2 million share bonus he's been promised. And we hope the share price will go up to reflect our performance and prospects, and that will benefit me, and certainly it will benefit all the shareholders. And that's the gearing of, of the reward that I get. It's, it only pays off if the shareholders benefit. City analysts did admit today's results showed some encouraging signs of underlying growth, but there was no denying they were bad. The question is, what will today's figures mean for mobile phone customers? Well, we may have to pay higher call charges. All the phone companies will be tempting us now with more text message services like football scores and horoscopes. And expect to be bombarded with offers of new services like emailing, which will make use of new telephone technology. Vodafone point to their new camera phones, for example, which are already being promoted in Japan as one way to increase future profits. What is clear is they'll need to excite consumers again before they regain the city's favour. Caroline Kerr, ITV News. The Queen has made her first speech to a session of the Scottish Parliament on the latest stop on her Jubilee tour. She spoke to MSPs who are currently meeting in Aberdeen and praised the role of Scots in modern political life. I value the distinctive contribution that Scotland is making to strengthen the bonds that link the nations and regions of the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and Europe. Football now. The Manchester United and Ireland captain Roy Keane tonight finally ruled out any chance of his returning to the World Cup. In a statement tonight, Keane said he didn't think it was in the best interest of the fans or the players to go back. The England World Cup squad had springs and their steps and smiles on their faces in training today. David Beckham will play in the first match against Sweden on Sunday. He worked out in private and then in public with his teammates. The coach Sven Joran Eriksson told our senior correspondent Mark Austin he didn't think he's taking a risk. This evening in Japan a smile returned to the face of England's captain and no wonder. Finally, he's winning a battle against injury, which just days ago it seemed he was destined to lose. It is news that has lifted the gloom here. He's back training with the squad, back having fun, albeit painful fun, and most importantly, back in the World Cup reckoning. But it was at this make-or-break session behind closed doors earlier where Beckham's World Cup fate was actually decided. Bare-chested in the midday sun, he was taking his trademark free kicks and corners under the watchful eye of England's medical staff. It was a spectacle that soon drew a crowd on a nearby hillside. And so comfortably did Beckham come through the session that coach Sven Joran Eriksson is confident that he can risk him against Sweden on Sunday. We think so, yes. He um, did a session this morning and he did uh, everything. Because I say risk, because it is a risk, isn't it? No, I don't think so. Uh, we don't think so. But it is a big gamble by Ericsson, who today had all 23 of his players together for training for the first time in the Far East. There is a doubt over Kieran Dyer, who's still not fully recovered from his knee injury. But that is a detail that will be lost on Beckham's oldest fan in Japan. She is 92, she was at the training ground today, and like millions of people in England, has something to celebrate tonight. So this is clearly a major boost for England. To say it is transforming expectations here is simply a measure of the player that is David Beckham. Mark Austin, ITV News, Awaji Island, Japan.
Tonight's headlines are, of course, dominated by the resignation of the Transport Secretary, Stephen Byers. He announced his departure at a surprise Downing Street news conference this afternoon. He admitted he had made mistakes, but he said he was not a liar. Tonight, back at his Tyneside home, Mr. Byers, no longer a cabinet minister, said today had been a nightmare for him. And that's tonight's news at 10 from all of us here. Good night. Gen, controlling energy for homes and business. Good evening. Blustery showers tonight. Uh, persistent rain really across Northern Ireland, northwest England and western Scotland. But it isn't going to be a chilly night. We're looking at lows of maybe 7 or 8, although winds gradually increasing near force, gale force down across the southwest. Tomorrow if we start off in the south, most places getting off to a bright note. Uh, some places in fact remaining dry, especially across the east and the south coast. Although some showers starting to develop, some of which could be fairly heavy. Now the further north you go, certainly more in the way of cloud showers being quite heavy in fact falling over the hills the best of the sunshine really across eastern scotland and the northeast of england temperature certainly cooler than of today at best we're looking at highs of 17 that's 63 fahrenheit power gym controlling energy for homes and business what has Sven brought to the England team? Good, good team spirit. He's put confidence in the younger players. I think he's a great tactician. He seems to have been embraced warmly by the British public as one of our own. He's picked the team that all the fans want to see. He has created a friendship and a camaraderie between the players. Sven has brought realism. Oh! Sophistication. His hair's always very neat. The World Cup kicks off with the opening ceremony Friday at 11, followed by France versus Senegal exclusively on ITV1. Life is nothing more than a song. Once in a while, one band takes the music world by storm. I'm a front man for a rock and roll band at my best. Returning to play Newcastle for the first time in two decades. Eric Burden, Bring It On Home, coming next.